The estate agent who sold them the house had talked a lot about flow. According to her, the open plan kitchen flowed into the dining area, which flowed into the living space and onwards, through the sliding glass doors into the small garden where whatever tide had dragged you there smacked up against the wooden fence. Amber had been almost a year old when Lynn and Day viewed the house, still a baby, but able to sit up and showing signs of wanting to crawl. Lynn had been struck by a vision of herself baking a cake while her daughter played on the rug in the lounge area. She must have been off her head, still drugged by pregnancy hormones, Lynn thought, as she arranged avocado and sprouts into a tortilla, rolled and tucked. The microwave clock read 7.45, but 11-year-old Amber was sitting in front of Good Morning Britain, still in her nightie. Dave was on the couch, stabbing at his iPad, his suit jacket slung across one of the dining chairs. The house's flow meant Lynn could see the mess it was in. The jumble of phone chargers, remote controls and gaming kit on the coffee table. Amber's discarded school blazer slumped on the banister. Dave's trainers resting heel over toe where he had tossed them on Sunday night. Amber's music stand, sentinel in the corner. And the rest. The detritus of their lives, flowing across the house. Lynn placed the shrouded vegetables into the Japanese bento box her daughter insisted on. Amber, you're going to be late again. Amber sat spellbound, the back of her head facing her mother, her hair a strawpater halo of kinks and tangles. Lynn forced two vegan shortbreads into one of the bento box's other compartments. The biscuits cracked along different fault lines. Amber. Her daughter ignored her, a stone, a rock, a boulder impervious to the flow of time. Amber! The girl looked round, her face scrunched with irritation. I'm watching this! Dave touched Amber gently on the back with his foot, his eyes still on his iPad. Don't talk to your mother like that. Amber's attention returned to the television. It's Angel Snow. She wrote the music for Flight Chronicles. Lynn shoved the bento box into Amber's school bag. Flight Chronicles had been part of their lives for four years now. When Amber was little, Lynn and Dave had taken turns reading her the escapades of Fleet of Foot Flight, a young, half-human, half-fairy girl rejected by both worlds who selflessly used her powers to help others. Dave was happy that their daughter enjoyed reading. Lynn supposed she was too, but the changeling's goody-goody capers irritated her. Sometimes, when Amber was in bed, Lynn and Dave bantered obscene scenarios for the fairy that Lynn always concluded with the tiny figure being squashed to death. Dawn Flight, the movie of the first book in the series, had been much anticipated. The film was a guaranteed hit, but no one had foreseen the scale of the soundtrack success. It had prompted mass international airplay, millions of downloads and CD sales. Amber swayed as the music swelled from the TV screen. The rush of melody and percussion set Lynn's teeth on edge. She stared at her small family, her husband and daughter, the backs of their heads. Amber, I won't tell you again. A familiar whine entered the girl's voice, I've got a sore stomach. Lynn smothered an urge to snatch the bento box from Amber's school bag and launch it at her. She took a deep breath. A woman of around her own age was being interviewed on the breakfast TV couch. It had been a bad news morning. This was the programme's up moment. The female presenter leaned into the camera. She looked tired, her skin grey despite her makeup. Angel Snow, you've been a composer for 15 years, now you've hit the big time. The camera closed in on Angel Snow's face, her wispy blonde hair and startled eyes. Angel smiled a nervous smile, showing teeth Lynn would bet her life had recently been renovated. I was lucky, Rick James heard a recording of my music, 
the presenter interrupted, the director of Dawn Flight. Angel Snow smiled again. That's right, Ricky heard my music. He liked it and decided to give me a break. Lynn set Amber's school bag on a chair. I know her. Amber's head whipped round. Angel Snow? Dave was looking at her too. How do you know her? We went to school together. We were in the same class. Amber snorted. She's much younger than you. Dave reverted to his mantra, don't talk to your mother like that. But his eyes flitted from Lynn to the woman on the TV screen and back. I'd look younger too if I'd just had my hair and face done by a professional makeup artist, Lynn snapped. She was a little creep, and no one called her Angel. She was Angela Snow. Amber got to her feet. She'd had a growth spurt recently and her nighty stopped midway up her thighs. Will you get her autograph for me? C could she get us onto the set of Ocean Flight? They're starting filming soon. Lynn picked up the remote control and turned the television off. We weren't really friends when we were at school. She wasn't a very nice girl, actually. Dave took his jacket from the back of the chair. Don't badger your mother, she's got a tough day ahead. He kissed Lynn's cheek and pulled his jacket on, ready to bolt for the train. Good luck, love. How many is it today? More than I'd like. He squeezed her shoulder. You're doing a good job. Gregor and McFarlane wouldn't survive if it wasn't for you. Lynn made a face. Tell that to the people I'm making redundant. Amber switched the television on. My tummy's sore. I can't go to school. Dave rolled his eyes. Do as your mother says. He flashed Lynn a last smile and closed the front door behind him. Angel Snow was embarrassed by the size of her suitcase. A small bag on wheels suggested busy, international travel. A bulky musical instrument case implied talent. Outsized luggage like hers inferred everything but the kitchen sink packing, disorganisation, hurried flight. The BBC guard opened a special gate next to the security turnstile for her. Angel nodded her thanks. She manoeuvred the case into the reception hall and out towards the taxi rank. The taxi driver watched in the rear-view mirror as Angel heaved her case on board. He drove her to King's Cross and sighed when she gave him the exact fare, as if he had known all along that she would be a bad tipper. Train journeys were usually opportunities to listen to music, but Angel turned on her headphones noise-cancelling facility. She sat by the window and watched the countryside scroll silently by. Fields, trees, cows, river, houses, 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 fields. The sky was overcast. She caught glimpses of homes and office interiors illuminated by electric lights, flashes of other possible lives. Colm had told her she would be all right. The money from Dawn Flight would more than see her through, and there was her mother's house, a wreck to be sure, but no doubt worth a bit. He and Megan, on the other hand, were reliant on what they could make from the quartet's uncertain touring schedule. It made sense for them to stay in the London flat. They would buy her out eventually, when things improved. Angel knew things would never improve. She had thought about refusing to leave, but it was ruined, all of it. The paintings they had chosen and hung together, the rug they had carried back from Camden Market, the curtains she had sewn, all of it. Every last stick of furniture and fold of fabric, spoilt. Megan was probably in the flat at that very moment, rearranging things, just as she had rearranged Angel's life. The view beyond the train window changed to grey sea. Cloud obscured the far shore, the distant view of France that was only visible on the clearest of days. She should have gone to Paris, Angel thought. Perhaps she would have, if her agent had not called and broken the news that the soundtrack to Dawn Flight sequel would be written by someone else. Rick James was concerned the success of Angel's theme tune had started to swamp the film. Her agent whispered the true cause of the death knell. The book's author disliked Angel's music. Angel suspected that what the author really disliked was having to share the limelight with another woman. Angel was the only person to disembark at the station. The taxi rank was empty. 
She opened the Uber app on her phone. The map glowed on screen. Familiar road names and buildings, unpopulated by potential rides. She shoved her phone in a pocket and waited. A fine drizzle had started by the time a cab arrived. The driver hauled her case into the boot, exclaiming at its weight. Angel told him she was just back from a shopping spree in Paris. Booze cruise, was it? the man asked, glancing her up and down. It was the way people spoke to each other here, sparring angry jokes that weren't jokes at all. Angel gave the driver a weak smile and told him her mother's address. The house was built from local stone cut a hundred years or so ago from a long since abandoned quarry. It stood on its own at the end of a short street. Angel smelt salt water in the air as she wheeled her case up the drive. The garden was overgrown. The grass reached almost to her knees. Shreds of plastic carrier bags, witches' knickers, fluttered from the branches of the apple tree whose fruit was too sour to eat. A stack of mail lay behind the front door. Angel leafed through it, fast food advertisements and charity letters damp against her fingers. She dumped her case in the hallway and walked from room to room. A sense of the work to be done before she could sell the place washed over her. It was fine for Colm to tell her she could manage. The film soundtrack was a one-off, the house a wreck that would not sell. Her mother's things were as she had left them. The knick-knacks Angel had known since childhood frozen in their customary places. Her mother's clothes were in the wardrobe, her pills by the bed, bottles in the kitchen. The last time Angel visited had been for her mother's funeral. She stayed in a hotel dropping by only to check that the place was secure, the water turned off. Angel was in her mother's bedroom, gazing at the drift of dust on the empty whiskey miniatures by the bed, when her phone buzzed. The text was from Colm. Solicitor confirms that as a dependent spouse, I'm entitled to 50% of all dawn flight and other earnings. Angel sank onto the bed. She had thought she was being supportive, while Colm struggled with the symphony no one wanted to commission. It had not occurred to her that loving him would make Colm her responsibility, even when he had ceased to love her. An unfinished miniature sat amongst the empties on the bedside table, waiting to help her mother rise from bed on the day she had died. Angel broke the seal and unscrewed its cap. The sweet, sharp smell of tears and late-night promises spoke to her of childhood. She poured its contents onto the carpet. As a child, Angel had known she would get out. Somehow she had allowed herself to be propelled back to where she started, but she was a fighter. No matter what it took, she would escape again. In theory, you could make hundreds of people redundant with the click of a computer key. Bad news hurtling from your fingers to their hearts in less time than it took to draw breath. Reality was more complicated. Protocols had to be considered, negotiations undertaken, employees' mental health respected. No one wanted accusations of heavy-handedness, the blame for broken marriages, multiple addictions, blood on the pavement motorway collisions, sudden falls and overdoses. Gregor and McFarlane Manufacturing had hired experienced consultants, but they were expensive and money tight, so Lynn, as head of human resources, was charged with overseeing the selection process. The man she interviewed before lunch cried, fat tears coursing down his chubby face. Lynn waited quietly, staring at the papers on the table in front of her. But instead of gathering himself, the man called her an obscene name and slammed out of the meeting room. He was not the first person to abuse her, but Lynn found herself crying too. The morning had started badly. Amber refused to get dressed for school. Lynn had tried patience, understanding, even bribery. Finally, Lynn had lost her temper. 
She grabbed her daughter by the fleshy part of her arm, dragged her kicking to the front door and shouted that she would push her out into the street in her nighty if she did not get ready. For a microsecond, Lynn had thought Amber was going to call her bluff. Then a group of girls had sounded outside, laughing and chatting on their way to school. She and Amber had stood silent, their eyes locked, breathing heavily from their fight. Then Amber hissed, I hate you. She ran to her room and returned dressed in her uniform carrying her violin case. Amber had slammed the front door just as the man slammed the door to the meeting room. Lynn wiped her eyes, checked her makeup and slid her laptop into her bag. Amber was a strange child, gawky with unruly hair and obsessed with the violin. Perhaps that was why she had fallen in love with Flight Chronicles. The half-fairy changeling at the centre of the books was a misfit, neither fully human nor supernatural. Lynn worried her daughter's aversion to school was due to bullying, but Amber rolled her eyes when she brought the subject up. According to the girl's form teacher, Amber was a quiet child, but her talent for music had enabled her to find a place in their community. Lynn distrusted words like community, especially when they were applied to schools and big business. Usually, she ate lunch at her desk. But today, Lynn stepped out into the industrial estate Gregor and McFarlane had relocated to after they put the Victorian offices that had housed the firm for nigh on a hundred years up for sale. The old offices had been prime real estate, perfect for conversion into luxury apartments. But the transformation had not happened. The once magnificent buildings mouldered beneath for sale signs, the cash injection the firm needed evaporated. Lynn took a bus to a nearby shopping centre and wandered through the shops looking for a present for her daughter. She settled on a white shirt with musical notes embroidered on the collar. As soon as the shop assistant scanned her card and folded the shirt into a bag, Lynn regretted the purchase. Amber would think the collar silly. Did the arrangement of notes even denote a tune? Lynn felt exhausted. There were more redundancies to administer that afternoon. She suspected that sooner or later her own name would appear at the bottom of the dismissal list. Lynn's lunch break was almost over, but she walked across the shopping centre to a cafe where she ordered coffee and a slice of carrot cake. It was a long time since she had been on her own with no task to complete except the consumption of sugar and caffeine. When had her daughter become a problem? Amber was only 11 years old, not even a teenager. Despite Amber's denials, Lynn knew bullying was at the heart of the girl's personality change. Lynn had been a schoolgirl. She knew that any difference, any awkwardness or insecurity could prompt torture and exclusion. Clever Amber, with her musical talent and electric curls, stood out. Standing out was dangerous. Lynn took the shirt from the bag and examined its jaunty collar. The other girls would crucify Amber if they saw her wearing it. Lynn would have to find another way to apologise for losing her temper. Angel Snow had fallen asleep on top of the bed in what had once been her room. She woke with her face close to the wall and remembered how... As a child, she had traced roads through the bumps and grooves of her bedroom's woodchip wallpaper, turning it into fantasy maps, roads to anywhere but there. She had escaped to music college aged 17, and after trying to make it as a violinist, had realised her heart and talents lay in composing rather than performing. Angel had survived for years on modest commissions supplemented by teaching, until the chance to write the theme tune to the film of Dawn Flight swept her towards the big time. Now, thanks to a poorly written contract and her two-timing husband, Colm, Angel was back where she started. Stranded in her dead mother's crumbling house in the run-down seaside town she had fought to escape. Angel wanted to draw the covers over her head and sink into her own misery, but instead, she got up, 
and rifled through her suitcase looking for something to wear. She had packed badly, smart London clothes that would look out of place in the small town. Angel remembered a girl at school who had taken to wearing a black beret. It would have been nothing out of the ordinary in most places, but other girls followed her around singing, Where did you get that hat? What started as a joke soon descended into sly shoves and insults. Someone snatched the beret and frisbeed it up onto a porter cabin roof. The girl did not know when to quit. She came to school the next day wearing a red cap, which ended up slouched on the guttering of the same roof. The game went on for three more days, three more hats. It ended badly. Kicking feet, ripped hair and gouging nails, jeering boys, humiliation. It was twenty years ago. But the town she had seen through the window of the taxi that ferried her from the train station to her mother's house had not changed much. It was still run down, its gap to High Street punctuated by abandoned shops and rough sleepers. Bad enough that she had experienced some kind of success without flaunting it. Angel found a pair of jeans and a navy sweater and pulled them on. She went through to her mother's room. The full-length mirror had been turned to face the wall. She turned it around and regarded herself. Her long white blonde hair was too distinctive. Angel pinned it into a bun. In these parts, women her age had their hair cut short into manageable styles. This was the best she could do. It was cold in the house, damp-smelling and musty. She stared into the glass, testing the atmosphere for some remnant of her mother, but there was nothing. She was gone. Only her things remained, gathering dust. Angel had intended to go into town for supplies, but the shopping centre bus arrived first and she hopped aboard. Angel realised she was hungry. She had been too nervous to eat before the breakfast TV interview she had given that morning to promote Dawn Flight and had not eaten since. She wondered what the jaunty television presenters would have said if she had told them the truth that this was the last promotional interview she would give. The director had informed her that he wanted a new sound for the film sequel. Angel suspected the book's author resented the attention her soundtrack was getting. That was the sisterhood for you, red in tooth and claw. If that was not enough, Colm had moved a cellist he claimed to have fallen in love with into their flat and was suing Angel for a divorce and 50% of her assets. It dawned on Angel that would include whatever she made from the sale of her mother's house. Sometime in the future, she might be able to laugh at the misery piled on misery of her situation. Right now, she felt close to tears or violence. Angel thought again of the schoolgirl who had been so insistent on drawing attention to herself. Had her mother's house prompted the memory... Or was it a reminder of the danger of standing out in a small town? The bus turned onto the ring road. A modern housing estate appeared on her right. Each home equipped with a neat drive and easy-to-keep garden, just large enough for a small patio and an outsized trampoline. The impossibility of selling her mother's decaying house hit Angel again. The road left the housing estate behind and skirted the edge of Harkness Woods. Her mother had been almost superstitious in her loathing of the woods. Her stories of what happened beneath their shade glimmered with lurid imaginings. Angel had been fascinated and repelled by them. The year before she left for college, she had taken to walking through the woods, half daring fate. Mostly it was the realm of dog walkers and young boys on mountain bikes, but she had, of course, been flashed at and slyly propositioned by older men. Her mother's warnings were vindicated. Soon after Angel left for college, the body of a young woman was discovered in Harkness Woods, buried in a shallow grave. Animals had scented her body and uncovered it. Angel's mother had forwarded cuttings about the case from the local newspaper. Her mind's eye could still conjure the police artist's impression of how the girl would have looked in life. Pretty, with long blonde hair, wide mouth and a snub nose. This could have been you, Angel's mother had scrawled in drunken letters on the margin of one of the cuttings. 
the bus pulled into the supercenter car park. Angel stepped off. She would find a cafe and then pick up supplies. Lynn was gathering her things when she caught sight of a flash of white blonde hair amongst the queue at the cafe counter. She dismissed the quick stab of recognition. Angela Snow was on her mind because she had seen her on television that morning. Then the woman turned her head and she saw that it was Angela. Lynn's first instinct was to slip away, but the woman had written the music to Dawn Flight, the film of the book Amber had been obsessed with since she was a small child. Lynn watched Angela collect mineral water in a pre-packed salad and ferry them to a free table on the other side of the room. It had been twenty years. Angela probably would not remember her face. Even if she did, Lynn was a mature woman with a family and a good job. She was safe. Lynn rummaged in her bag for a piece of paper. All she could find was a leaflet about coping with redundancy. She took a napkin from the table. It would have to do. Angela was raising a slice of cucumber skewered on a plastic fork towards her mouth. She saw Lynn approaching and lowered it slowly. Lynn sensed recognition in the other woman's eyes and something else. Fear. It had not occurred to her that after all these years, Angela Snow might be afraid of her. She bared her teeth in a smile and crossed the room. Angel Snow put her plastic fork down and stared at Lynn. The bustle continued around them, but the cafe's patrons and the shoppers moving through the swimming pool brightness of the supercenter beyond were like extras in a film in which she and Lynn were the unlikely main players. Lynn smiled. Sorry to interrupt you, but you're Angel Snow, aren't you? It was twenty years since they had last met. Lynn was older, the hair that had been long and mousy brown when they started high school and orange and spiky by the time they left, was now carefully tinted in autumn shades and styled into a soft bob. Angel had forgotten most of her classmates, but she would recognise Lynn anywhere. Lynn's smile widened. My daughter's a huge fan of anything to do with dawn flight, especially the music. She's a talented violinist. She'll be over the moon when I tell her I've met the film's composer... Would you mind giving me your autograph for her, please? Her name's Amber. She held out a paper napkin and gave a self-conscious laugh. I'm sorry, I don't have anything nicer to write on. I, I probably have something. She rummaged in a handbag and found a postcard she had intended to send to Colm before she had realised his affair with Megan was not a passing midlife crisis, before he had informed Angel that he was divorcing her and was entitled to half of her assets and earnings. The picture on the postcard was of a bulldog playing the cello. Something about the dog's expression had reminded Angel of Megan. She had hoped that Colm would notice the resemblance and realise how ridiculous it was to throw aside twelve years of marriage for a half-rate cellist. It was not even as if Megan was younger or prettier than her. She was somewhere around Angel's age with broad hips and a son at university. Angel wrote... To Amber, good luck from Angel Snow, kiss. She drew the opening bars to Dawn Flight's theme below and handed the car to Lynn. I hope she likes it. Thanks, and sorry for bothering you. You must get sick of autograph hunters. Angel glanced at her salad, hoping Lynn would take the hint and leave her in peace. I don't get asked often. People rarely recognise a composer. Lynn smiled. That surprises me, you have a distinctive look. Something in her tone prompted a flutter of nervous irritation in Angel. Lynn slipped the postcard into her bag. Once seen, never forgotten. She smiled. What brought you home? And Angel realised that Lynn knew who she really was, or rather, who she used to be when they were both girls. 
Lynn caught a cab she could not afford back to the office. The time she had spent with Angela Snow meant she was going to be late for her next meeting. She took the card Angela had signed out of a bag and looked at it. Amber would be over the moon. Lynn would explain to her daughter that issuing the redundancies was affecting her nerves. Perhaps they could forget their fight that morning and get back to some kind of normal? She put the card away. Amber was only 11 years old, but once she made up her mind to be awkward, it was impossible to change it. Her daughter would love the autograph, but it was no guarantee of a truce. Meeting Angela Snow had made Lynn feel diminished. As if pride in her own achievements, her small family, their home, her promotion to head of HR, had been leached from her. Angela Snow had always been able to suck the good feelings out of people with a look. Lynn took out her compact and fixed her makeup. She had three people to take through the redundancy process that afternoon. What would it be like to be Angela and have a God given talent to save you from a job like hers? Their daughter's aptitude for the violin had surprised Lynn and Dave. Neither of their families was musical. The lessons had started as an attempt to focus the girl by introducing her to a hobby. They might as easily have chosen judo or ballet, but for some reason Lynn had fancied the idea of music lessons. She wondered now she had been prompted by an unconscious memory of Angela Snow. Lynn watched the fare on the taxi meter climb. She would never have admitted it at the time, but as a schoolgirl she had coveted Angela's violin case. She had liked its curves, the way the case swung jauntily on its handle. Later she had envied the bohemian air it invoked. Angela's blonde hair had been marred by split ends when she was a child. Her uniform had been tatty. She and her clothes were not always clean. But the violin had marked Angela out as someone with something special about them. An interior life not everyone could enter. Lynn's phone buzzed, a message from the office letting her know that her first appointment was waiting. She texted that she was on her way. She had thought talent a fickle thing to base a future on, but Angela Snow probably earned more money than she and Dave put together. Lynn muttered, Good for her. The taxi driver met her eyes in the rearview mirror. Perhaps he was used to people talking to themselves in the back of his cab because he dropped Lynn at her office without a word. Angel unpacked her groceries in her mother's kitchen. The room was gritty with grease and dirt, but she made no effort to clean it first. Once the groceries were stowed away, she went from room to room, making a long inventory of what needed done before she could sell the place and move on. Moving on seemed imperative now that she had run into Lynn. The back bedroom gave a view over the old part of town's rooftops. Beyond them she could see the sea, slate grey, a shade darker than the sky. Her mother used to call that room the guest room, though no one had ever slept there within Angel's memory. She used to come up here sometimes and practice her violin, staring out at the horizon. Angel had expected to encounter some essence of her mother in the house, but it was her younger self who seemed to haunt the deserted rooms. She had thought she had experienced her quota of life's misery in her childhood and adolescence, but now it seemed that her quota of joy was small. She had used it up between college and her first few years of marriage to Colm. Angel wished she hadn't pretended not to recognise Lynn. It had been stupid, a throwback to adolescence. She considered taking her own violin from its case and exercising the house with music, but it was months since she had been able to bear the thought of playing. She should have been contemplating new compositions, but found she was only drawn to old melodies. Another call to the ghost of the girl she had been? Or was the ghost of that girl calling her? Time was strange, a concept rather than a solid thing. Who was to say that she and her former self were not both present in the house? like tracks on a vinyl record waiting for the needle to decide where to drop. Angel was startled by the sound of a phone. She reached for her mobile, then realised the ringtone was different. 
an old-fashioned bell reaching through the empty house. She hurried to her mother's room and answered the phone by the bed. Hello? Angel half expected an automated caller inquiring if she had had a recent accident that was not her fault. Instead, she heard a gasp of breath. A voice she recognised said, Is that Angela Snow? She sat on the edge of her mother's bed. My name is Angel. It sounded stupid, in a way it never had when she was in London or touring Europe. The voice continued, We met earlier in the Supercenter Cafe. You gave me an autograph for my daughter, Amber. I'm Lynn Stokes. You used to know me as Lynn Thomas. We were at school together. Angel did not bother to ask how Lynn had got her mother's number. Lynn Thomas had always had ways of finding things out. I remember. I wasn't sure if you recognised me. There was a lamp on the bedside table. A frou-frou thing with a cerise shade. Angel clicked it on and off again, casting the room in pinkness, then returning it to the grey light of the fading day. I recognised you. Why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you? I don't know. We weren't exactly friends when we were at school, were we? No. Angel let the silence hang between them. Lynn said... My daughter's a talented violinist. The wallpaper in Angel's mother's room was floral, the petals prone to evil faces. Angel clicked the bedside light on again. What makes you think that? Her teacher told us, and we hear her play. I, I don't know much about music, but you only have to hear her to know she's talented. Congratulations. Lynn took a deep breath. I wanted to ask if you would help her. Why? She's talented and... Lynn paused as if gathering herself for an apology or an admission. She reminds me of you. Angel kept her voice neutral. That must be difficult for you, Lynn said. It only struck me this afternoon after we met... Obviously you don't owe me anything, but I wondered if I could bring her round to play for you. Her teacher's good, but I get the feeling that she's taught Amber all she can. I'm not a teacher. Lynn sounded exasperated. No, but perhaps you could let her play for you? Just once, and, and give her some tips? It's hard for young people these days, especially around here. It's always been hard, especially around here. If you could tell her how you made it, it might help. Angel felt an urge to laugh. Her life was in freefall, a bombed-out spitfire plummeting to earth, but to Lynn she was a big success. You really think it's a good idea? Lynn sounded exasperated. We're grown-ups, we both know how to behave. Angel turned off the lamp. The sea had swallowed the sun, shadows overwhelmed the room. OK, Angel said into the darkness. Bring her here after school tomorrow. She hung up without telling Lynn the address. Lynn placed her phone on the countertop. Amber was on the other side of the breakfast bar staring at her. What did she say? Did she say yes? Lynn knew now how a hostage forced to demand their own ransom might feel. She said yes. We've to go tomorrow. Amber hopped from one foot to another, more animated than Lynn had seen her in months. Where do we go? Her mother's house. Amber did a little pirouette. What's it like? I don't know. She never invited anyone round. Her mother wasn't well. I guess she couldn't cope with visitors. What about her dad? I told you we weren't friends at school. I never heard anything about her father. Lynn remembered how Angela Snow's house had looked from the road. An old house of quarried stone, sharp edges worn smooth by the wind. She felt a tingle of excitement indistinguishable from dread and turned to her daughter, ready to say that she had changed her mind visiting Angela Snow was not a good idea. 
Amber grabbed her in a hug. You're the best mum in the world. I can't wait to meet Angel. Lynn steered the car into the old part of town. It was early, not quite five in the afternoon, but already drinkers were huddled outside the bars that lined the town centre, cigarette smoke merging with their cloudy breath. The dark was coming in. Empty shop fronts and toilet signs retreating into the shadows as the neon blaze of pubs and restaurants glowed awake. It had been a struggle to dissuade Amber from bringing all her dawn flight memorabilia for Angela Snow to sign. Eventually, Lynn had managed to limit her daughter to one CD, DVD and poster. After all, as Lynn pointed out, Angela had not written the book, she had merely composed the soundtrack to the film. Amber, whose default had been set to sulky for weeks, would not shut up. Lynn tried to tamp down her irritation. Wasn't this what she wanted when she had all but begged Angela to meet them? Lynn turned the car away from the bright lights towards the heights, the hill above the seafront where Angela Snow's mother had lived. The houses on the heights had originally been built by rich merchants who escaped London with their families during the summer months. Later they had become boarding houses for middle and working class families holidaying by the seaside. By the time Lynn and Angela were at school, holiday makers had been lured overseas. Most of the houses on the heights had been broken up into bedsits and apartments. The district was colonised by disillusioned hippies, punk rockers, students and newly arrived immigrants, an intersection between people on their way up and their way down. The heights was where you went if you wanted to write poetry, score drugs or sex. The town's own slice of hate Ashbury where no one cared if you were gay or on the game. The district's bohemian edge had receded. Aspirant property owners had recently started to restore some of the houses, but the heights was not yet gentrified. It remained a place of transients and drug deals where people were reluctant to walk by night unless they had business to undertake. It was warm inside the car. Amber cradled her violin case on her lap, playing with its catch. You think I should play the dawn flight theme for Angel? She might be sick of it. What other pieces are you thinking of? Amber rattled through a list of compositions, outlining their merits and disadvantages. Lynn let her daughter's words wash over her. She had not been up to the heights for years, but knew the way by heart. Angela Snow's house was in darkness except for a light in an upper window. Amber's voice was anxious. Do you think she's home? Lynn unclipped her seatbelt. Don't worry. When Angela Snow says she'll do something, she does it, for good or for bad. Lynn took Amber's hand as they walked up the drive through the unkempt garden. Typical of Angela not to put on the porch light to guide them. She expected Amber to snatch her hand away, but the girl returned her grip. Lynn realised her daughter was nervous and felt another stab of irritation. All this fuss for Angela Snow. Angel was uncertain why she had agreed to Lynn's request to hear her daughter play. Did she fear what might happen if she refused? Or was she curious to see Lynn's daughter? The girl was eleven years old, the same age she and Lynn had been when they had first met. Angel watched Lynn and Amber negotiate the path to the front door from the window of the darkened lounge. The girl's gangly body and wild curls gave her a cartoon silhouette, like a lit match. The doorbell rang. Angel counted to ten and then went to meet them. The overhead light in the hallway had lost its shade. Lynn and her daughter looked startled in the glare of the naked bulb. Amber was wearing the same green uniform blazer that Lynn and Angel had been forced to wear as schoolgirls. Lynn's smile was tense. Thanks for letting us pop round. Angel looked at the girl. Your mum tells me you're a talented musician. Amber's cheeks flushed pink. I want to be a composer when I leave school. I hope you don't have expensive tastes. The money's not what it's cracked up to be. Angel led the way through to the lounge. 
She was aware of how the house must look to them. The old furniture her mother had inherited from her parents and never bothered to replace. The walls that had not seen a fresh coat of paint in Amber's lifetime, the shabby carpets and ugly ornaments. You don't need to be the best performer to be a composer, but you do have to know music inside out and be able to use modern technology. Do you think you can handle that? Amber asked, what type of technology? Computer software, various sound programmes, it's tricky. Lynn said, she gets top marks in her computer classes. The girl seemed to shrink inside her school uniform. I enjoy programming. That's a start. Angel nodded to the violin. Would you like to play something? Amber fiddled with the fastening of her violin case. She glanced uncertainly at her mother. Sure. Angel smiled at the girl for the first time. It's hard to play in front of an audience. Why don't we leave your mum down here? I'll show you where I practice when I was your age. It's just upstairs. Amber looked uncertain. I... I... Lynn interrupted. She can just as easily play for you down here. The girl stuck her chin out. I'd like to see where you practised. Angel turned to Lynn. Do you trust me with her? Amber's a big girl. Leave the door open, please. I, I like to hear her play. Lynn gathered her bag to her and sat on a chair opposite the old-fashioned big box TV that no longer worked. She took out her laptop. Take your time, I've plenty of work to keep me busy. The curtains were open in the back bedroom. The lights of the seafront fairground glimmered in the distance, the ferris wheel turning brightly, like a jewelled wheel of chance. It was colder up there than in the lounge. Angel clicked on the two-bar electric fire she had taken from her mother's room. Let's heat the place up before you start. We don't want your string snapping, or your fingers. I bet this isn't what you expected my house to be like. The girl bit her lip. I didn't know what to expect. Angel raised her eyebrows. A butler and a swimming pool? Amber laughed. Maybe. This is my mum's house. She died. I'm here to wind up her affairs. Her affairs. It was a strange way to describe the sticks of furniture and decaying house her mother had burdened her with. Angel rubbed her hands together. Ready? Amber took her violin from its case and positioned it under her chin. She drew the bow across the strings, adjusted the instrument's tuning and started to play. The dreary bedroom was overwhelmed with the colourful opening notes of Angel's composition. The movie theme tune that had gone viral, the music that had been poised to change her life before everything fell apart. Angel went to the window and looked out onto the night. Amber's playing was all Lynn had promised, but it was not the music so much as the sense of possibilities lost that made Angel feel like crying. She had settled for less than she should have. Her childhood had taught her she was worth nothing. When Colm had shown an interest in her, she had responded. Their marriage had been a mistake. Now she was alone and all but broke. The final notes of the tune hung in the air. Angel waited a moment. The ghost of her face reflected in the window pane. She turned to look at the girl. Good. Now play me one of yours. She had ignored Lynn's request to keep the door open. The electric fire was doing its work. The room had grown stuffy. Amber's face flushed with heat and excitement. Angel said, Take your blazer off if you want. It's warm in here. Amber folded her blazer onto the bed. She unfastened the cuffs of her school shirt and rolled the sleeves up. This time Angel leaned against the wall and watched as the girl raised her bow and launched into her own composition. The music was good. Not young Mozart good, but good nevertheless. Amber was only eleven years old, but she understood music. The girl's curls bobbed in time to the rhythm. She moved her bow arm upwards and her sleeve fell back. Angel glimpsed the outline of fingers. 
blue-black against the girl's pale skin. She caught her breath. The spell was broken. The line of beauty that had connected them snapped. She waited until Amber stopped playing. That was wonderful. Your mother's right. You have talent. Angel took the girl's violin and bow from her and set them gently on the bed next to her blazer. I couldn't help noticing the bruises on your arm. The girl pulled her shirt sleeves down. It was an accident. Angel smiled and gently, gently touched the girl's shoulder. Don't worry, no one's going to get into trouble. Do you mind if I have a closer look? The girl nodded, wary. Angel rolled both sleeves back. The impression of fingers glared dark on the girl's skin. Amber's face was red. It was my fault. I, I didn't want to go to school. Mum lost her temper and grabbed me. She didn't mean to hurt me. Angel touched the bruises with her fingertips. It can be hard to keep your temper. Has this happened before? Amber shrugged. I can be annoying. I annoy her. Deliberately? The girl grinned. Sometimes. <laughs> Do you really think my composition is good? It's remarkable for your age. Amber's face clouded and Angel realised she had said the wrong thing. Remarkable, full stop. She felt a whisper of cold air. The bedroom door was ajar, Lynn's face framed in the crack, watching them from the hallway. I heard the music stop. Angel started away from the girl, unsure of how long Lynn had been standing there. Your daughter has talent. I'd like to help her. Amber hopped from foot to foot. Please, Mum. <laughs> Lynn looked from one to the other. I don't think so. Angel opened the door wider and drew Lynn into the room. You can trust me with her. Amber whispered, please. Lynn lifted her daughter's blazer from the bed and shoved it at her. There aren't any buses to the Heights and your dad and I don't have time to drive you up here every week. Angel said, maybe the school could lend us a room. Lynn's voice took on a formal edge. Amber already has a violin teacher. She also has a lot of schoolwork. Amber had pulled her blazer on. The uniform made her look younger, her hair wilder. She started to protest, Mum! But Lynn had taken her by the arm and was propelling her from the room. Angel followed them into the hallway. Mother and daughter teetered dangerously at the top of the stairs. The girl trying to turn their course, Lynn determined to leave. Angel reached out a hand, careful, but they were already starting down towards the front door. Lynn clutching the banister with one hand, her daughter with the other. She opened the door, pushed Amber into the night and turned to give Angel a last look. You don't belong here. You never did. Keep away from my daughter. Angel stood at the top of the staircase. I didn't ask you to come... The front door slammed, cutting off her words. Angel woke with the conviction that she must escape her late mother's house and get back to London. She phoned Colm and told him that he and Megan had three days to get out of the flat. After 12 years of marriage, she should have predicted how the conversation would go. Her not-yet ex-husband told her he had already changed the locks. Possession, he said, was nine-tenths of the law and he would have no hesitation in setting the police on her if she turned up on the doorstep. Colm used the gentle voice that had always aggravated her. Remember, you've already been cautioned. The police advised me to press charges. It was only my good nature that prevented you from getting a criminal record. It's all on file somewhere and it doesn't look good. Angel said... It's my flat. I paid the deposit and made the mortgage payments. You never contributed anything. She could hear Colm smile. Doesn't matter. I'm a dependent spouse and there are no kids to sway the judge in your favour. Angel slammed the phone down, lifted a pillow to her face and screamed into it, though the nearest house was too far away to hear her cries. 
When the phone rang, she thought it was Colm calling her back, but it was a female voice on the line, shy and hesitant. Angel said, Megan, you have to get out of my flat. This is Amber. I got your number from my mum's phone. I wondered, you said you'd help me. With your violin? Yes, with my violin and composition. Angel had not yet disposed of the empty whiskey miniatures on the table by her mother's bed. She put them into a triangular formation like some whiskey army trooping into battle. Lynn doesn't like me. Mum doesn't like anyone. Angel knocked one of the miniature bottles over. It set three more falling in its wake. You're eleven years old. I could get into trouble if I met you without her permission. The girl sounded outraged. Seriously? I'm sorry. Keep playing and keep composing. You've got talent. You'll get there without any help from me. Mum can't stop us bumping into each other. We could meet and say it was an accident. Angel laughed. <laughs> You're like your mum. Once Lynn gets an idea into her head, she can't shift it either. I'm not going to meet you. Good luck and take care of yourself. The girl was saying something, but Angel lowered the receiver gently onto its cradle. Amber was Lynn's daughter. It was better not to get involved. She lay back on the bed and looked at her mother's room. The rosebud wallpaper full of hidden faces, the dusty clothes draped across the easy chair, the overdue library books and kitsch ornaments. This was all that remained. A better daughter would compose a requiem. A better mother would deserve one. How would it sound? Violent crescendos interspersed with boozy intermissions, a sentimental melody and knife-sharp strings. Angel thought again about the bruises on Amber's arms, the way Lynn had all but pushed her daughter down the stairs. Talent was a fragile thing. It could be strangled as easily as the poor girl who had met her death in Harkness Woods. Her own childhood had contained its share of shoves and bruises. School teachers had looked the other way. If someone had spotted her talent sooner, she might have escaped for good. Instead, life had brought her back to where she started, via brief success and a faithless husband. Angel got out of bed. Why should Colm and Megan make a love nest of the London flat she had worked so hard for? Colm was demanding half her earnings in the divorce settlement as if he was a wife who had raised a family and catered for her husband's career. Angel had fussed after Colm's needs, made his meals, bought him time to work on his symphony. She would rather blow her capital on a good cause than give him more money. She reached for the telephone. The old high school had been knocked down and rebuilt since Lynn and Angel had been pupils. Lynn had grown used to thinking of the place as Amber School, but today it was almost as if she could see the ghost of the old high superimposed on the new buildings. Dave took her hand and they crossed the playground together. Whenever Lynn glimpsed US prison yards in movies or documentaries, she was reminded of school. The corridors and playgrounds had had a feral edge that encouraged tribalism and bullying. Lynn had not wanted to send Amber to the new high, but she and Dave could not afford private fees and it was the top-ranked school in their town. Dave squeezed her hand. Don't worry, love, it will be OK. Of course it will. Lynn would like to drown the children who were picking on their daughter hold their heads under water until they cease to struggle and leave their bodies to drift away on some wave. But Amber was not blameless. She flaunted her musical talent, carrying her violin around like a comfort blanket. Then there was her hair. Lynn would have sneaked into Amber's room while she slept and chopped the untidy mop herself were it not that Dave would go ballistic. They reached the entrance to the main building. Lynn let go of Dave's hand and straightened her coat. Work was hellish, redundancies waiting to be processed, and she was sacrificing an afternoon of precious annual leave. Amber's school refusing was a malignancy. 
eating away at the home she and Dave worked so hard to build. The headmistress was adamant. Their daughter was not the victim of bullying. The only problem was Amber's refusal to attend school. Amber signed into registration today, but we've checked every classroom in the school. Your daughter isn't here. Dave got to his feet. Where is she? Lynn pulled him back into his chair. Bunking off. The head nodded. Amber doesn't believe we have anything to teach her. Her focus is confined to music. She can't see the value in learning anything else. I'm sorry, our only option is to suspend her. Dave said, that's ridiculous. Lynn gathered up her bag and coat. Don't bother. We're withdrawing our daughter from your school. Dave started to protest. Hang on a minute, love. The headmistress looked relieved at a problem so easily solved. Let us know Amber's new school. We'll forward her files. Dave got into the car and slammed the door. Lynn slid into the passenger seat. Dave turned the key in the ignition and steered the car out of the school car park. The headmistress told you. Amber told you. She's not being bullied. Lynn took out her phone and glanced at the new app she had installed the previous evening after she and Amber had returned from Angel's house. Amber sticks out too much. Other girls don't like that. Call her and tell her to come home right now. Lynn looked at her mobile. We'll go to her. You've guessed where she is? I don't have to guess. I installed a tracking app on her phone last night. Don't look at me like that. How else can we know what she's up to? Trust? Respect? Lynn snorted. We're her parents, not her friends, Dave. Take a left at the next junction. We're four minutes away. Autumn was almost at its end and leaves were falling orange and gold in Harkness Woods. Angel and Amber walked side by side down one of its less used paths. The girl's violin case swung by her side. Angel had left her hair down. It fanned across her shoulders like a christening shawl. You'd have to move to London during term, but you can stay with me. My apartment isn't far from the Royal Albert Hall. We can go to concerts together. She expected Amber to make some protest about missing her parents, but the girl looked wistful. Mum and Dad can't afford to send me to music school. They won't have to. If you pass the audition, and you will, I'll set up a trust and commit to paying your fees. All you have to do is persuade your parents to let you take up my offer. Angel's lawyer had confirmed that having the girl live with her would be useful leverage when it came to deciding who got the flat in the divorce settlement. Angel reminded herself that was not the reason she was helping Amber, though she could not deny a small frisson of pleasure at the thought of Lynn's reaction. Amber kicked at a mound of dried leaves. Dad might agree, but there's no way Mum will let me go. She'll let you. If she loves you. No, she won't. A small voice whispered inside Angel. Why are you tormenting the child? Why are you tormenting yourself? Angel sat on a tumbled tree trunk. Will you play me something? The girl clicked open the case, took out her instrument and slid the bow across the strings. She adjusted the tuning and then glided into the opening bars of Angel's composition, Dawn Flight. Lynn's heels were not designed to grip the forest floor. She stumbled after her husband towards the sound of the music. They found Angel and Amber in a clearing, looking like fairies in a pre-Raphaelite painting, blonde and dark against the autumn leaves. Lynn started forward, ready to grab her daughter. Dave held her arm. Let her finish. Angel's eyes met Dave's. He returned her smile. When Amber reached the final notes, they caught each other's eye again and clapped. 
Lynn did not join in the applause. I could have you prosecuted for kidnapping. Angel stood up and dusted flecks of moss from her jeans. I'm sorry, I didn't think you'd mind. Amber ran up to her parents. Angel's arranged an audition at a music school in London. It's one of the best in the world. She'll pay for it. Lynn took a step towards Angel. I told you to keep away from my daughter. Dave held up his hands. Slow down, he looked at Angel. Is this for real? Angel nodded. If you and Lynn want it to be. Lynn turned to her husband. This woman made my life a misery when we were at school. She came back to steal our daughter. Amber shouted, You're a liar, Mum. Angel wants to help me. Angel pushed the hair back from her face. I didn't seek you out, Lynn. I came back to sort out my dead mother's house. You learnt I was in town and asked me to hear your daughter play. Dave looked at Lynn. Is that true? Lynn shook her head. It was a mistake. Angel shrugged. I won't speak ill of you in front of Amber, but one of us was bullied at school. It wasn't you. I can offer your daughter a life-changing opportunity. It's up to you whether you let her take it or not. I don't want my daughter anywhere near you. Angel picked up a bag. I'll get going. Amber started to cry. Dave looked at Lynn. You just withdrew her from the best school in the district, remember? He held a hand out to Angel. I appreciate your interest in Amber. This sounds like something we should discuss. Can I invite you back to our place for coffee? Lynn said, Dave, no! But he and Angel were already walking away from her through the forest with Amber by their side.